so uh, let's start off. You know, please start by introducing yourself, introduce your work, and, and, and why you're here, uh, and what you want to talk about today. Joanne, tu veux commencer? Oui. Bonjour, mon nom est Joanne Zakestiwi de Wendake. Je suis propriétaire de la plantation à Manadien Stiwi. C'est une, une, une plantation privée. Et euh, on m'a demandé justement de faire une, euh, un tour. Euh, ce que je fais, je, je suis semencière, mais aussi je travaille très fort pour la sécurité alimentaire. Et j'ai un texte justement que j'ai préparé pour vous pour euh, faire connaître un petit peu comment faire des affaires avec euh, nous, les gens des Premières Nations. Merci, à tout à l'heure. Merci, Joanne. Donc, tu vas pouvoir nous partager tes points euh, au fur et à mesure dans la discussion. Sally, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, so go. My name is Brandon Sunny White um, for Akuzasne uh, Mohawk Territory. And okay. oh, yeah, well, what do you do? What do you do in Akuzasne? How, how, what's your relationship with farming and, um, and my, agriculture? There? My relationship with farming and agriculture is um, currently I'm in college in the States, um, doing legal studies as well as working with the greenhouse at the neighboring university. Um, they do a lot of farming. I do a lot of work with them, help them with their. Um, We do like nightly dinners and weekly dinners that we also open up to um, the campus community. So I do a lot of work with that as well as I do um, work um, with farming and um, planting with um, the elder in our community. Thanks, son. Curtis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Curtis Lazor. In my present capacity, my career, I'm an environmental assessment officer with the Moa Council of Akwezasme. So our environmental assessment is based on a framework that's designed after the Thanksgiving address. So in our Thanksgiving address, uh, we identify all the elements in our lives. We start with the people, and then we work our way up. I'm not sure if we could the opening day for this event, but uh, it's something customary to our people, the Haudenosaunee people. Um, I'm directly connected with agriculture and farming and producing uh, traditional foods for our people. Um, I have two gardens of my own. I help in community gardens. And with my position as an environmental assessment officer, I'm trying to stay on top of uh, our network of activities going on within not only Akwesasne and Mohawk community, but also other Haudenosaunee communities and even Anishinaabe communities to identify what they're doing so that we can learn from each other and we don't have to create the wheel over so that we can get tips from each other. And really our Aboriginal communities and Indigenous people, um, we, we talk a lot about sovereignty and we want to run our own lives and the government's always running us, um, whether it's residential schools or whatever initiatives come out in that. But um, I, I believe real sovereignty is being able to feed yourself, not be dependent on handouts or contributions from someone else other than your own community, your own family, your own people, so on and so forth. So I'm trying to piece things together. I got Sunny and I got John here on board to um, identify activities that we can participate in with each other. Thanks. John, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, what you're doing with the market gardening and the greenhouses? Well, my name is uh, John Bonaparte. I'm also from Alcazesne. Uh, I'm currently a project coordinator for Strong Roots Community Garden. It's a 501c nonprofit, Nakuzasne, started in 2016. I've been there as project coordinator for two years, soon to be three. And uh, yeah, so we do a lot of uh, uh, donating vegetables. We're on five and a half acres, just added another two and a half, and in the future room to add another seven. So we're a pretty large operation for Market Garden. Uh, So yeah, we donate a lot of vegetables from everything that we sell. Uh, all the proceeds go into a grant fund for the Stronger Charitable Foundation. That was uh, started uh, in 2014 as a way to empower our community and uh, provide a safe place for our youth and elders. Um, so we've uh, been trying to do as many community projects as possible. We donate uh, a lot of pods of plants to like raise beds. We do uh, presentations at schools around the community and different organizations. And uh, this year we just uh, started the Akuzasne Farmers Market, which was went amazingly well. We had 13 vendors at one point. I was not sure how it was going to turn out, but it went extraordinarily well. So glad to hear. 
Oh, can, we, can we take picture? No, can we take picture? Yes. Okay. Because if I want to talk to you, I I have so many people here. I don't know. So you take it. My name is Valerie Gurmadabwan Gabriel. I'm from Ganesadage and um, I'm a mother of one beautiful daughter, 30 years old. Uh, I'm currently in university. I haven't never been, so this is a very big experience for me compared to my farming background. Um, I've been farming ever since I was a little girl. My uncle had a very large scale strawberry uh, and berry apple farm. And so I spent my summers uh, weeding and harvesting with all of the uh, immigrants that lived in Montreal. They would take a bus down every day and I would be by their side harvesting. Um, so that is kind of where my interest in farming um, came from and once I separated myself from that, I was always missing something. And I always knew that the environment was important to me, uh, but I didn't know how to express that at that time, especially coming from a place where uh, people around you um, aren't very aware, which thankfully now today, people are becoming more aware. Um, after, uh, my experience, so my background is environmental and wildlife management. So this is what I do for a, life, for, for a living. This is how I earn my cash because farming doesn't bring me any cash. Um, I uh, used to have an organic um, vegetable farm, which I turned now into uh, a garlic farm and currently trying to develop uh, a learning center in Gunasanaga for uh, the youth and for adults in all of the sister communities. Um, so I like to bring myself to the table as um, not somebody who is just really focusing on one thing. I try to implement um, being human uh, through every level of how we interact with our environment. So this is uh, my background and, and who I am and what I do. So now, thank you, thank you, Valerie. Um, I'll, I will also take a opportunity to say that, that Charlie, Charlie uh, Jacobs uh, from Jacobs Farm was uh, was uh, it was planned to have him here today. He declined to participate uh, today, uh, and I'm not going to speak for him. But uh, I think uh, some follow-up conversations would would be welcome to uh, to uh, to uh, to see where that's coming from. Um, so uh, Valerie, you, we were, we we're speaking two themes today that we, we were proposing to discuss, training, education, and, uh, and access to funding. Um, Valerie, you mentioned that you were doing a, a learning center. Uh, you, you folks come from different backgrounds in terms of your, how, how you learn about farming. Uh, you also, you're also becoming in some ways teachers for other people, mentors. Um, can you can you speak about your your, your positions as, as learners, your, your learning curve, uh, and uh, and you know where you see yourself going in the in the in next few years in terms of, of lear as learners and, 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 and as teachers? Okay. Okay. Yeah. A lot of questions. Um, and we can bring, I'm just bringing themes, and yeah. we can bring a conversation wherever okay. wherever you want. And okay. if we have nothing to, to, to add, you know, we can open it to the, to the floor. Okay, okay. Uh, so today, actually, I would like to introduce one of the uh, student workers who I've had for the past two years. Her name is Gary Wilhetsla Couples. Uh, she's a community member, and she's a very beautiful, talented young woman from my community. Uh, so we had the opportunity to have her a second year, which was this past summer, as a, a summer student worker. Um, this program is offered through the uh, Gonesadagi Human Resource Office. Um, and with that opportunity of having her uh, from the first year that I had her to the second year that I had her, there was a lot of growth that happened in terms of how the farm was operating. So the farm that I used to have, it was uh, myself, my ex-partner, and that's, we just operated the farm for several years until we, uh, until we had a, um, a summer worker. Uh, we never found that we could make enough money to actually pay for a worker, and we were so off in the distance that we, aren't, we weren't close to volunteers, 
and there was no access to, um, to helping hands at a, a minimum cost. Uh, so the reality is, is that the, the farm that I used to operate, uh, we, had, we went to two different markets, we sold to restaurants, and we sold through basket numbers. And this, um, this was kind of faced with uh, the reality that uh, there was always like, uh, because we were, I was from Gunasadali, like it was uh, always uh, like, a, I, I don't want to bring racism into this uh, issue, but it kind of is, because uh, the farm was Gunasadali farm. That was the name of the farm. And there, I always had a lot of time, uh, a hard time getting traction for, for getting um, members in the surrounding area, which is Oka, which is also a very heavily um, farmed area with, with uh, old uh, farmers from France. The, the family line was still strong there. Um, so having access to summer students uh, is really helpful uh, through this phase of the farm and as well as the older phase of the farm. We had a, a summer worker for two years in a row when that farm was still operating as it was. Life happens. Uh, life, you're, you go where you're supposed to go. Uh, a lot of things happened for me, but I always kept growing something at the farm. So, I mean, this just kind of follows the cycle of uh, farming. You know, things grow, things die, things grow, things die. And for me, this is kind of the, the main thing that I kind of like to really teach at the farm. And uh, it's, it's basically honoring and, and, and supporting that method of uh, seeing the world and how we are really truly supposed to operate as human beings. Uh, this is, it, the, the farm itself now has many different components. We try to bring in all the new age stuff, you know, grow mushrooms, uh, uh, giving workshops, chickens, uh, even, it, I, I kind of feel crazy, but uh, I like to teach along the lines of like a little bit of chaos. Okay, where in schools there's always so much, um, you always have to follow something like it's supposed to be this way. Well, in fact, what if it's not supposed to be the way that we were always ever taught? Mm -hmm. And maybe this is why we are seeing all the issues we're seeing. So the farm, I, I would like to implement the, that train of thought at the farm for all of the youth that come into the farm and allow the youth to really uh, develop their own voice and their own method of, of interacting with, with the environment. So I encourage uh, the, uh, the students to kind of take on their own projects, even if it is, it is challenging, it's easier said than done, uh, because there's always like the human nature of fear to kind of go in and get something started. Uh, so it does it deals with a lot on a psychological level, but also spiritual, emotional, and physical. Uh, so I'd like to bring that into the aspects of the workshops and, and the student workers who come at, uh, at the farm. Um, I believe that, uh, okay, so we'll go back, jump towards uh, a funding, uh, financial aid in terms of being uh, uh, a native farmer. Um, I don't, my, the way I'm programmed is that I don't believe that I need to be part of um, the UPA. So when I was when I was farming, when I first started farming on, on the CSA level, I was I had uh, a president of the UPA uh, join the uh, the basket membership, and very friendly, he was like, "Oh yeah, you got to sign up with the UPA. Like this is what you have to do." Uh, and I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it." And then when I started talking to people, they're like, "Well, do you really need to?" And uh, after, after I did, after I told him I wasn't going to, he stopped being friendly with me. And then when I tried, like years down the line, when I tried, when I tried to go um, purchase a tractor uh, to just start getting that information on how much it would cost, uh, uh, how can I pay for it, the, the financial uh, assistance that the, the, the business would offer me, uh, and because I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a special farmer's card, I couldn't get the, 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 the longer, um, the more years to pay the tractor off. And I, it just, these are just some of the things that I have encountered. It's just one of the very few things. Uh, there are a lot more. 
but in terms of making money for the farm and continuing as um, an educational farm, uh, I, I, I have to just take it day by day, otherwise I kind of, I, I get a little uh, overwhelmed with, well, how, you know, I don't want money to run my life and it's important for me to take it day by day so that I just, you know, I, I don't rush into things, which I think is kind of the opposite of how every other business farm operates. And, I, and I, it is an opportunity for me to be able to do this with the other um, incomes that I have. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is all I have to say. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Valerie. Okay, thank you. So, so in summary, you went from a CSA farm to a learning center, and, and you were mentioning some of the barriers to access credit for farm equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, a, a holistic learning is part of your approach to teaching and mentoring uh, 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 students. And uh, another challenge you were mentioning was access to, to uh, 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 you know, labor, access to people for, uh, okay? What is UPA? Union des producteurs agricoles, it's the main uh, farmers union in Quebec. You know, as soon as you make more than five grand. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. OFA. Yeah, that's right. UPA, yeah, good question. Um, John, you, you're, you're working for, for a, a nonprofit, right? Uh, and, and you guys uh, do uh, teach uh, 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 youth uh, and, and people across different age groups. Uh, you've also had your own learning background, uh, your own learning trajectory. Um, how is it to be a teacher? How, are, are, what opportunities are you seeing in the community in terms of, of teaching? Or do you find there's interest for, 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 uh, for learning in, in, in farming in Arkansas? To be honest, I really never wanted to be a teacher. I just wanted people to learn. <laughs> but it's like there really aren't many people that are really pushing this uh, kind of sustainable agriculture uh, method out in the community. I think that with the newer uh, age groups of people that are uh, coming up, they're kind of getting more into the holistic farming, kind of uh, wanting to get back to their roots. Alcazosne used to be a farming community, and uh, now a lot of it's just gone back into wetlands, things like that. And there's a lot of hay farmers with and, uh, a lot of beef cattle, but uh, not so much for vegetable production. Uh, I've been kind of, uh, trying to put myself into those situations for teaching at like a, well, more presenting at a, at like a elementary schools, things like that, where I'm going to inspire kids to be able to keep these things in their mind and that, that they'll uh, know how to grow and not be scared to take those first steps. Uh, I did a presentation this year at the Boys and Girls Club and uh, there, it was probably like a six to eight or nine year olds, and I told them about a mycorrhiza fungi, just like a real rough lesson on it, and so that it helps trees speak with each other. And then, like probably four months later, I went to elementary school, and I had a little girl come up to me, and she's like, "There's a fungus that helps trees talk to each other," and I was like, "Man, I wanted to cry." It was like awesome. That's like that's great. It's like so. It's like. It, you can't give them too much, I guess, as children. But uh, that I figured was like, <laughs> I was like, and I don't know if any of this is gonna stick with them, but that was like a six-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. But, so I also like, I like to consider the farm as an educational uh, farm where uh, we also do a similar program. It's called Access in Akwazasne where we're able to get uh, summer students, uh, pretty much most of their costs paid for. So we had five summer students this year, and not quite to the degree that Valerie's doing it, but I kind of try to push them to like figure out what their style is, what they want to do. Like we supplied a nursery with potted plants this year, things like that. I try to push them into like uh, taking their own uh, lead in each job. So uh, uh, we had five kids that were age 15 up to 17, and. I'm pretty confident that every single one's going to come back next year when none of them, met. well, one of them had a kind of farming background, but they all want to come back. So uh, I'm trying to push the future, push them to become the future leaders in Akwazasne, and uh, they all want to see people eating healthier. Uh, we have high diabetes rates, things like that, and uh, they all can see that 
it's all their family and stuff like that. So I think uh, with those five kids and then hopefully an additional two or three next year, uh, we're gonna keep pushing that education and hopefully get these kids to keep doing what I'm doing and going to schools and teaching kids when they're older too. So, so you're, you're saying you're, you're working with like with younger children and then some, some, some teenage, more, more teenage years and, and you're, you're a reluctant teacher uh, and, uh, and you, you're, but you're hopeful to see to, to, that, that these, uh, some of these youth are gonna come back next year and that they've, they've taken interest for, for farming. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I mean, I, I, a lot of times when I'm doing a presentation, I'll just warn everyone that I'm a farmer way more than I am a presenter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, it's like uh, yeah, so it's like, I've been working on my speeches and mm -hmm. things like that. You know, Toastmaster subs, yeah, yeah, yeah. things like that. <laughs> but, yeah, so uh, I'm trying to push them. And then also we're doing, I, I've done like a, a presentation for adults only too, where mm -hmm. that was just strictly gardening, not really farming. and just trying to make it as easy as possible for people to feel confident to go out and start their own garden, to be able to feed themselves mm -hmm. and have a little more self-reliance. And, and remind us, uh, where did you learn about farming? You, you followed a program, a specific program on the U.S. side, right? Um, uh, what do you mean by the program? Like, like uh, you, you did a, a, I was reading your bio, like a market oh, okay. gardening volunteer master program. Yep, uh, there's actually, uh, I started, I grew up on a farm that had a, like about 30 to 40 head of beef cattle. And then my grandpa also always had tons of horses, like 20 to 40 horses. And also like sometimes huge herds of ponies back when there was a profit in ponies. Yeah, it was awesome seeing a huge herd of ponies running. <laughs> but yeah, and then uh, I've also spent time working for my uncle who had like uh, 15 beef cattle and he had horses too. So I've kind of always been around agriculture. Mm -hmm. Also spent some time on dairy. I'm not a big fan of dairy, so <laughs> it's like, so it wasn't that great of an experience, but yeah, so I never expected that I was gonna be a vegetable grower, maybe a field crop. Mm -hmm. Like I always thought like, growing up, I thought more land was like better, things like I needed as much land as possible to be able to be a successful farmer. Now I'm kind of narrowing my mindset on that, where I'm more about the sustainable agriculture, small scale, uh, kind of, I like the permaculture mindset mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so I took a Cornell Cooperative Extension Master Gardener uh, course in starting in the end of last year and then in the beginning of this year. And that's kind of where I do pretty much is like, I kind of do like free consulting around the community, things like that. I'm there for somebody to reach out to. I probably won't know the answer right away, but I'm, I can get a hold of people that will know the answer. And then, uh, also, uh, I took the, uh, an ag tech program in Cornwall, and uh, that was awesome. Like, I like ag all types of agriculture, and that put, like, taught me so much about like uh, using GPS systems and tractors, mm -hmm. things like that. Things I'm probably never going to be involved in, but I think having that huge open mindset of knowing every aspect, as much as I can about every aspect, is super important. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, kind of just don't get a one-sided views on things and I can kind of understand why people want to do the massive huge farms mm -hmm. but it still kind of led me to want to be as small as possible <laughs> so, uh, although we're on quite a bit of acreage but still try to keep it small scale <laughs> yeah and remind us how many how many acres are you guys working on in Nakusasa? Uh, oh uh, we've been on five and a half this season we started prepping for another two and a half two and a half three acres and uh, we didn't completely fill it with crops this year. And then uh, next year we're gonna use all of that. So it'll be about eight and a half acres, but probably about two and a half of it will be in cover crop. So okay. not completely in production. Yeah. And then we have room for like another seven acres okay. where I hope to eventually bring on animals for okay. livestock. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, hey, Curtis, last time we were, we were talking, we were, we were mentioning that you, uh, you were thinking of, of doing uh, a degree uh, and uh, can, can, can you tell us about, about how, how you've come to, uh, you know, your own learning curve uh, around farming and, uh, and you know, what brought you to that, to that decision? Well, I also grew up on a farm as a young boy and we always had a vegetable garden. I thought it was punishment to get in there to <laughs> clean it, to take care of it. You better get out there before your father gets home from work. So. 
weights were flying, and uh, we had probably 20, 25 head of beef cattle, which was pretty big in my my younger days. My father grew up on a dairy farm, so we grew up in that culture of getting up in the morning, milking the cows, and watering them, feeding them. Um, we passed those um, work values down to my brothers and I, so um, it was just natural. I went to school, went to college, went to university, finished university with a degree, couldn't find any local work, um, started with the local learning. Well, this is gonna be my food, learned some basic canning techniques, because I'm food preservation. Um, now I'm very interested in food systems and how we can relearn our traditional food system so that we can try to combat diabetes in our culture. We got a very high rate of diabetes throughout North America with the, the indigenous populations. So we have to start teaching people how to eat the traditional diets. And agriculture or farming is only one aspect of a whole spectrum of, of a food system. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to tell people, you know, I know you're a fisherman. I don't want you to stop fishing, but I want you to plant a little garden, something that you can handle, you know, maybe um, 10 by 10 plots, you know, put your favorite vegetables in there. Learn a few things, I want to help you, you know, I got jars, and want to, you need some help candy, uh, you need some recipes for relish, or whatever. Let's be a support now for each other so that we can encourage you. Do a little bit of hunting, do a little bit of fishing, do some farming, um, gather some wild animals. That's good for you. It's all good medicine for you. What you put in your body, you, you know where it's coming from, you know what's in it. And it's not as easy as going to the supermarket and buying a liter of soda pop, a bag of chips. That's very, very bad for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get this across to our people to say, listen, you know, this is, this is sovereignty. We can feed ourselves and we're dependent on ourselves. So I'm trying to create this or recreate our food system and try to identify uh, what our people used to eat before uh, our diets changed so severely. Um, understand that history. Why is it this way? How did we leave from our traditional diets and we get into this North American popular diet? Um, a lot of it's the division of labor, the roles uh, each family member plays in the family. Um, whereas before, my parents' generation, the division of labor, everybody had something to do on the farm. When it came to food preservation or food planting, it was a shared activity. So the burden wasn't put on one person, whereas today, I have my own garden, well, I have two gardens, and I'm, I'm out there weeding. I'm out there watering. I'm out there harvesting the food. So I started creating my own food system where I can um, harvest a few bushes of tomatoes and I'll take it over to my cousin. I'll provide her with mason jars and say, you can them, keep half and give me the other half. Mm -hmm. So it works out for her. Mm -hmm. She puts in a little sweat equity. Um, she gets some canned tomatoes. I get some canned tomatoes. Mm -hmm. It's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can teach families to do this within their own family mm -hmm. units, um, to come together, you know, do these type of traditional activities that mm -hmm. we've had all the time, um, everybody will will be close and mm -hmm. will be drifting further and further towards that end goal of getting back to our traditional diets. You know, I want people to understand because we bring in scientists and we take samples of the fish in the river and they say it's polluted and don't eat it because it's bad for you. But what exactly is the pollution? What are the compounds in there? How much fish can we actually eat? Because if you're aware that Alcazar is split by international borders, so we have um, mirroring governments, community governments on, both, on the U.S. portion of Alcazar and the Canadian portion of Alcazar. We're at an advantage as well as a disadvantage with that. So mm -hmm. we have an environmental program on the southern portion that has an, a full agricultural program. They're planting white corn. They they're raising pigs. They have chickens. They put their eggs into local stores. They sell um, pork to uh, on the U.S. side. On the U.S. Okay. Part. Um, but our program at the Mohawk Council on the northern portion has very little agricultural activity. Okay. So I'm the agricultural program. Uh -huh. When there's a question pertaining to environment and agriculture, they point at me and they say, Curtis, is in, he's into food security, so ask him. Uh -huh. He's the one that plants the garden at, out back. He picks the apples in the tree. He's the one that's always planted nut trees. Mm -hmm. 
you know and i tell people it's it's hard work mm -hmm. you know but get a friend involved get a family member involved make it a mm -hmm. day activity for your family mm -hmm. you know take a picnic out to the apple orchard and just mm -hmm. pick 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 so it's that really learning process that learning curve but not everybody's going to um catch on you get somebody that's interested and they'll come out and they'll find out, oh man, that hurt my back, you know, so I'm not going to show up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. we have to, we have to take the good with the bad. Mm -hmm. So, so you mentioned uh, uh, support systems, you yep. mentioned, uh, you know, coming to that stage, to that point where, where, you know, farming is, is one avenue, one source of food, but there's also fishing, there's also harvesting, there's also hunting. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and you were also mentioning some of the, the you know, unequal support programs on, on each side of the, of the border. Yes, in, in my professional capacity, I'm fortunate enough where I can meet and I can reach out with um, government agencies and organizations to discuss funding opportunities for a community. Mm -hmm. And we can host workshops, we can partner with the Strong Roots program mm -hmm. and say, listen, um, there's an event, there's a food summit going on. Let's get our people involved. Let's mm -hmm. let's go. Let's make that network and the connection. Mm -hmm. So I'm fortunate enough where I can be a representative of Mohawk Council Environment Program. Sit down with Environment Canada and say this is what we need. Mm -hmm. um, I can go with the Quebec Province or the Ontario Province and say the same thing. Mm -hmm. This is the direction we want to go in. Mm -hmm. Either you're on board or we're going to do it ourselves. It'll make you look a lot better if you support our activity. Right. And it might be some grants here or there, or you know, we can do fruit trees, nut trees, which we had a good conversation about on our on our way here today, about implementing a, that type of um, hazelnut groves, thickets. Um, the butternut tree is getting inundated with uh, um, an invasive fungus. Okay. So they're dying at alarming rates. Our black ash trees getting hit by the emerald ash borer beetle another traditional activity mm -hmm. basket making industries was massive in Akwazasna it's getting harder and harder to find the black ash tree to make our splint baskets all these traditional activities so trying to get them all together find out who's doing what and then just map that and say okay listen you don't have to do it all over mm -hmm. go talk to Curtis go talk to Sonny mm -hmm. go talk to Johnny mm -hmm. thanks Sonny um your uh, tell us about how you're you're learning about farming uh and and how you're working with john and and, and curtis so um for me like my great grandfather he was a farmer but um like being my great grandfather he had already um finished his whole farming thing he was older so i learned a lot from him into in terms of like the stories he'd tell me about like he had cattle he had horses um and with that like then he passed on and i always looked for like another elder in our community to um, learn from. And then, um, lucky enough, like I came across an elder who um, just just by luck, he was like, hey, like um, you wanna help me plant? So I was like, I've never done it before, but sure, I'll learn. You know, like, and through that, like, I got to plant white corn, I got to plant potatoes, and potatoes, and um, just beans, squash, and through all that, I um, really seen, like, the whole fact of coming from um, like the whole farm to table um, concept of when we when uh, it was time to harvest, we got to, all the food that was on the table for that night. We were able to, you know, we had farmed. So also in addition to that, I um, have been very um, pushing hard to get our youth more involved in that because I think that's a big thing. We can't let farming um, just go to the side and be forgotten about. I think it's really important that we continue on that tradition as Curtis and John both spoke to Akwazasni was a huge farming community and um, I've had the uh, you know honor to work with both of them and um, just this past fall I got to work with John and his um, strong roots and we we're able to plant some we we're able to plant corn we we're able to plant beans and squash and um, we had youth involved in that I think that's a big thing is the fact that you know, we're able to teach that next generation and the youth coming up the importance of agriculture and, um, you know, the fact of, like Curtis spoke to, the fact of diabetes is so rampant, you know, across North America and we need to be able to get back to our um, traditional diet and our traditional roots. And um, in the past, I've had the honor of going to Minnesota and um, attending a food sovereignty conference and 
being able to have a diet that was actually um, locally sourced right in Minnesota from the wild rice to the different beans that they're using and um, an indigenous chef prepped it and he brought it, he had brought in bison and you know just being able to have an actual like traditional meal and see like what it um, composed of as well as I've um, been able to work with um, and attend different opportunities with different organizations in southern Ontario with the Aboriginal um, I think it's called Aboriginal Health Network and they gave me a cookbook of different um, recipes that are you can locally source so I've been looking to that as well like being in the university um, realm and where I am it's very big um, farming farming town so I try to source a lot of my stuff from the local community as well like give those farmers a chance as well as you know see what we can do in um, Akwazasne Thanks Sunny. Joanne, merci pour la patience. Euh, donc, euh, donc, je te laisse prendre la parole, puis tu nous emmènes où tu, peux nous, où tu dois nous emmener et t es, t es, continue la discussion sur, euh, sur l'apprentissage, c'est ton propre parcours d'apprentissage en tant que semencière, en tant que productrice de semences, mais, euh, mais aussi les, les, les éléments de, de, de réflexion que tu apportes autour de, euh, de, faire, de faire des affaires avec des, des entreprises euh, autochtones euh, et euh, et les, 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 les irritants, finalement, hein, en termes de, 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 de financement, etc. Je te, je te laisse prendre la parole. Oui, oui. Bonjour. J'ai 68 ans et je fais partie de la relève pour les Wanda, parce que ça fait à peu près 300 ans qu'il n'y a pas eu d'agriculteur et d'agricultrice. Donc, je suis une jeune relève. Euh, avant de faire l'agriculture, dans ma famille, c'était de la vente de plantes médicinales, ma grand-mère, etc. Et on en a bu beaucoup chez nous. Euh, alors, quand, quand j'ai commencé, c'était ça que je voulais faire. Mais entre-temps, chez ma grand-mère, j'ai découvert, quand j'avais 6 ans, la pauvreté. On n'était pas riches, mais disons que ça allait chez nous. Mais j'ai découvert la pauvreté des gens pauvres et des gens autochtones très pauvres. Et ça, je me suis dit non, je n'oublie pas ça. Et j'ai vécu la pauvreté. La pauvreté, là, c'est quand on ne mange pas à la fin du mois, quand on est mal nutri. Et quand j'ai euh, été au cégep, j'ai connu la faim. Et je pas pu travailler dans le domaine auparavant parce que, pour différentes raisons, je n'ai pas pu le faire. Mais que, ça m'est toujours resté. Moi, ça fait 11 ans que je travaille euh, comme semencière. Et euh, j'ai mon mandat de semencière, de faire des semences, etc. Mon orientation est différente de, de mes amis euh, Mohawk. Je connais leur orientation. C'est qu'en ayant en tête des gens qui ont faim, ces gens, je parle des Premières Nations tout le temps, on a 30 de diabète typique. Donc, euh, moi, je m'oriente davantage vers euh, le, le diabète. Et dans ma ferme, et j'espère d'avoir d'autres fermes, si ça vous intéresse, mes amis Mohawk, je vais être contente. J'ai un projet avec le Yacon. J'ai une autre, il y a une ferme, euh, Charlie, justement, Charlie Jacob va faire partie du projet parce que j'ai besoin d'autres fermes autochtones. Et ça, ça, c'est toujours à part avec le, le, le diabète. Donc, mon orientation est différente, mais ce qui est important, c'est d'avoir euh, toutes les choses sont bonnes de toute façon. Et quand je vous ai dit tout à l'heure, pour, euh, pour faire une différence euh, qui est reliée à la malnutrition, le diabète et la pauvreté alimentaire chez les Premières Nations, je suis très engagée. Et j'ai fait des analyses et tout ça et, euh, pour vraiment convaincre du monde parce que c'est très... C'est pas sexy, hein, parler de pauvreté. C'est pas sexy, surtout quand c'est des gens de Première Nation. Là. Alors, euh, j'avais un texte de Madame euh, Judy Wilson, mais je vais le laisser tomber parce que euh, après mes dix tours, merci beaucoup. Donc, je vais vous parler des obstacles et des irritants en agriculture et agroalimentaire en milieu autochtone au Québec. J'ai pas fait le Canada parce qu'à un moment donné, il faut apprécier les recherches. Peut-être que ça va vous donner des idées ou de l'information. 
Donc, l'administration de la loi sur les Indiens est gérée en fonction des structures du Conseil du Trésor. Tout ce que je dis, là, il y a des références, d'accord? C'est pas dans ma tête, là, c'est comme ça. Les conseils de bande sont administrés et gérés comme des municipalités, ce qui est encore un obstacle et un irritant pour les communautés. Le gouvernement fédéral produit des programmes, si on entend toujours des programmes, qui viennent avec des subventions. La reddition de comptes est très onéreuse en temps. Ces programmes laissent très peu d'espace à la créativité. Les services ou secteurs travaillant pour les conseils doivent appliquer les programmes qui procurent de l'argent et qui se comptabilisent bien. C'est ça la réalité aujourd'hui. Pendant que je vous parle, c'était comme ça hier aussi, ça va être comme ça encore demain. Ces programmes ont commencé avec la loi, sur les, la loi sur les Indiens qui empêchait de promouvoir l'entrepreneuriat chez les Autochtones. Ensuite, il y a eu les agents des Indiens qui apportaient des subventions timides. J'ai déjà profité d'une petite subvention en transport quand j'étais euh, à l'université. Euh, donc, des subventions timides à la pièce et des aliments. Ce rôle a disparu depuis les années 70. Donc, les programmes euh, ont évolué en fonction des problèmes euh, de, de plus en plus nombreux, par des monkeys, donc on parle des polices montées, de la santé par des infirmières, des médecins, des travailleurs sociaux, parce qu'on a des suicides, de la violence et d'autres, mais pas de programme pour assurer une nutrition saine, ou en agriculture, ou euh, des grenobles au service de l'agroalimentation chez les Premières Nations. On a toujours des programmes, mais pas en alimentation. Donc, les conseils de bande des réserves, ce qui les intéresse, c'est d'avoir une subvention qui sert gérer parce qu'on leur a montré comment gérer les autres programmes. En agriculture, c'est l'inconnu total, à tel point qu'aucun des sept organismes provinciaux autochtones n'ont pas dans leur mission les mots « faim »,« agriculture »,« agroalimentaire » ou « pauvreté ». Maintenant, je vais vous parler de la division structurée pour et chez les Autochtones. Au Québec, il y a plusieurs types de divisions structurées pour et chez les Autochtones. La loi sur les Indiens a interdit durant des générations de sortir de la réserve, de s'instruire et de faire des affaires. Suite à l'évangélisation au Québec, il y a les parlants français et anglais de deuxième langue. Les réserves avec et sans traité et les conventionnés, Agriculture Canada offre des subventions différentes si les communautés et non le territoire se trouve en haut ou en bas du 52e paragraphe. Quand je dis que les communautés, on, on parle de réserve. Le territoire, c'est la chasse, la pêche, etc. Au Québec, le MAPAC, avec le plan Nord, offre des subventions différentes si les communautés et, et non le territoire se trouvent en haut ou en bas du 49e paragraphe. Le, le MAPAC peut offrir des services, mais régionalement, donc, il y a, comme moi, là, je m'associe à une ferme, là, à Kenawake. J'aurai un problème, là, pour, au niveau du MAPAC, à cause... Je sais que je peux avoir des, 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 des services en agronomie, mais ça va être problématique. Donc, la difficulté, c'est une entente d'affaires autochtones, euh, agricoles ou alimentaires se, se situant dans deux régions différentes. C'est plein d'entraînes. Les subventions d'agriculture en agroalimentaire du fédéral ou provincial s'adressent à la communauté. Or, c'est une vision colonialiste de croire qu'un groupe de personnes vont se lever et disent qu'ils veulent une entreprise en, en agricole lorsqu'il n'y a aucun programme, que personne n'est formé sans aucune connaissance ni de formation du milieu agroalimentaire. Ces programmes font qu'encore aujourd'hui, une grande partie des Autochtones s'attendent à la gratuité en tout, ce qui fait que plusieurs communautés sont inertes par ces situations qui persistent et les maladies de toutes sortes, incluant le diabète. Le diabète, chez nous, là, c'est clair, amputation, dialyse, toutes sortes d'affaires qui résultent de cette colonisation-là. On est là-dedans, là. Aucun chef de file, ça je parle des chefs autochtones, on n'a aucun chef, excusez-moi, pas des chefs autochtones, on n'a aucun chef de file en agroalimentaire chez les autochtones. Aucun organisme est un chef de file. Présentement, il n'y a aucun chef de file 
à l'agroalimentaire à partir des sept organismes autochtones provinciaux. Les centres de recherche et chercheurs ont le champ libre. Ils, euh, ils n'utilisent pas le... On a un protocole de recherche de l'Assemblée des Premières Nations, mais les chercheurs, là, ils ne l'utilisent pas. Donc, ça veut dire qu'ils prennent le contrôle de, si on en a, euh, si on fait affaire avec eux autres, ils, prennent le, ils, ils essaient en tout cas de prendre, ou ils prennent le contrôle de nos programmes. Donc, ce protocole-là, qu'est-ce qu'il dit? C'est que c'est des protocoles de recherche et de développement. C'est très bien fait. Le quel archive pour l'utilisation par toutes les Premières Nations des recherches et des résultats. Comme moi, je suis présentement, j'espère d'avoir la subvention pour euh, la recherche et, et euh, recherche et développement pour le Yacon. Et si, mettons, eux, d'une autre communauté, veulent savoir qu'est-ce qui se fait, ils vont tout avoir l'information. Parce qu'on utilise ce protocole. Et pour moi, c'est sacré. Euh, ces programmes font encore. Euh, non, excusez, je me suis fait par grâce. Aussi, il faut dire que la crainte, c'est que si on euh, n'a pas beaucoup d'expertise euh, pour rédiger un projet en agroalimentation. Donc, probablement, ce que vous savez, c'est que pour obtenir une ou deux subventions, il est préférable d'avoir une section recherche et développement dans le projet. Donc, il faut s'associer. Mais là, très souvent, ces chercheurs-là, ils prennent le contrôle parce qu'ils veulent avoir toute l'information. Mais moi, ce qui m'intéresse, c'est que les autres nations aient le droit d'avoir cette information-là. Les personnes en les ressources aux chercheurs en agroalimentation colonisent les habitudes de partage des autochtones en établissant, en établissant des jardins communautaires et non collectifs, les fameux bancs. Ce qui résulte que c'est de la, la culture urbaine en milieu autochtone. Ce qui, résulte que, ce qui résulte que les personnes pauvres, là on parle des gens qui ont faim, qui sont très souvent en distance des n'ont pas plus accès à cette nourriture fraîche et saine, parce que d'habitude, les gens qui vont, qui, qui, qui utilisent dans ces bacs-là, dans, dans, dans plusieurs communautés, je connais moins les communautés du Sud, je connais plus les, les communautés plus nordiques. Donc, c'est des gens qui ne sont pas les plus pauvres, euh, et puis, euh, ils ont peut-être un petit peu plus d'argent, quelque chose comme ça, un petit peu plus, là, parce que ce n'est pas des millionnaires. Là. Donc, euh, mais il n'y a pas de... Il n'y a, a pas de partage. Bon, euh, ce qui résulte que, bon, c'est ça, des serres surgissent sans offrir de la formation en entrepreneuriat et en réseautage d'affaires régionales. Il n'y a pas d'assistance technique pour bien choisir les matériaux d'une serre en fonction de sa région et de son climat. Vous comprenez qu'il y a une différence en, entre... Mettons, mes amis qui sont à la poisse qui sont 25, dans la zone 5, et puis mes amis et nous qui sont dans la zone 3. Hein? Bon. Euh, ce qui résulte que ces projets de serre ne pourront pas devenir autonomes. Ils seront encore obligés de se nourrir de subventions. Le plan Nord structure la subvention pour qu'il n'y ait pas de vente pour rentabiliser les serres afin de nourrir les diminuer et de continuer à être en affaires. C'est totalement ridicule, mais c'est comme ça que ça marche. Je vous parlais de la pauvreté et de la faim. Présentement, le nombre de personnes dans la pauvreté, c'est-à-dire qui sont mal nutries, qui ne mangent pas leur faim ou à la fin du mois, qui sauvent des repas et qui sont malades au du diabète, atteints de plusieurs euh, maladies. Là. On a 30 de nos, de nos gens qui sont atteints du diabète. Or, cette situation n'a guère, euh, n'a aucun écho à la, chef, à la table des chefs. Là, je parle des chefs euh, de, des, des différentes euh, nations, des Premières Nations, ni des gouvernements. En 1980, Jean Chrétien signait le traité de Rome contre la pauvreté et la faim chez les Canadiens et les Autochtones. Ce programme devait se terminer en 2015. À niveau de une différence. Les produits d'épicerie qui, qui, qui viennent du Sud sont choisis par les commerçants du Sud et non des réserves. Les subventions, là je vais parler des subventions qu'on trouve, qui sont très rigides. Les agences en agriculture et agroalimentaire fédérale provinciale ont des, ont des subventions super rigides. 
Les personnes qui désirent obtenir des subventions n'ont pas la formation pour rédiger la demande. Je vais donner un exemple. J'étudie présentement des études de, au niveau de la maîtrise. Je ne suis pas capable de rédiger une demande de subvention en, en agriculture. C'est tellement hermétique. Alors, il y a beaucoup de personnes là, qui, ont, qui ont seulement leur cinquième année, ou même pas, qui sont capables d'être des bons fermiers. Pensez-vous qu'ils sont capables de rédiger quelque chose? Absolument pas. Donc, euh, on n'a pas non plus la formation pour établir un budget, ni la formation agronomique ou économique pour calculer ce qu'un hectare peut produire ou reproduire. La majorité des nations n'ont pas un arpent de terre agricole, ne savent pas comment louer les terres hors réserve et ne connaissent pas l'agroforesterie. Les projets que les chercheurs proposent ressemblent davantage à du jardinage. Ce qui est intéressant, mais ne nutrit pas les plus pauvres et malades de nos communautés. Certains projets sont soumis à une étude de marché de faisabilité dans la réserve. Je le sais, j'avais en relais, j'ai appelé un bureau territorial. Euh, et puis, c'est ce qu'on disait de faire. Moi, je dis que c'est une perte de temps. Les autochtones ont été étudiés des pieds à la tête. Les statistiques sur la pauvreté, le nombre de malades chroniques comme le diabète sont des chiffres accessibles dans tous les centres médicaux de nos réserves. Et il suffit de démontrer l'urgence d'un projet agroalimentaire. C'est tellement ridicule, là. On a nos statistiques. On n'a pas besoin de, 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 de mise en marche, de, pas de mise en marché, mais de, de calcul, euh, si ça va être faisable ou pas. Là. Si on a des gens qui sont intéressés, allez-y. C'est ridicule. Il y a des, y a des gens là, qui meurent quasiment de faim. Alors, laissons le contrôle de côté, laissons choisir les communautés qui, euh, si c'est agricole ou agroalimentaire, qui leur convient le mieux. C'est eux autres à décider. Il n'y a même pas de programme pour les informer sur les possibilités en agroalimentaire ou en agriculture. Il n'y a rien de ça, hein? D'autres irritants. Le dernier obstacle et irritant est que, contrairement aux organismes non autochtones, les organismes autochtones ne s'associent euh, aucunement avec des bénévoles, même s'ils si ont des, de l'expertise en agroalimentation ou s'ils sont des commerçants agroalimentaires. Cependant, la Fédération des femmes autochtones a une structure différente qui permet l'engagement de personnes non employées. Mais il n'a pas euh, de mandat lié à l'agroagriculture. Et puis, malheureusement, ils ne sont pas tout à fait écoutés par la table des chefs. Les premières nations euh, québécois et canadiens partagent la même, nous partageons la même histoire. D'une part, il y a les colonisés et les colonisateurs. Le terme réconciliation, un des quatre éléments du cercle de Guérison, est utilisé politiquement par les colonisateurs. Cela leur permet d'observer la résilience des Autochtones. Car les trop nombreuses personnes des Premières Nations qui ne s'alimentent pas à chaque jour d'aliments nutritifs disponibles, faciles à se procurer à un prix raisonnable, ne peuvent pas être résilientes. Elles souffrent de malnutrition. On les traite en quêteux. Elles sont humiliées dans leur dignité. La sécurité alimentaire, ce n'est pas le comptoir alimentaire. Il y en a un à, à Wendake. Et puis, malheureusement, euh, y a, y a, chez nous, c'est euh, vu qu'on a une école euh, qui réussit bien euh, auprès des étudiants, on a des étudiants partout du Québec, des étudiants autochtones. Alors, on a euh, des Wanda, mais aussi on a des gens d'extérieur. Alors, ce n'est pas quand même euh, agréable de voir ces gens-là au comptoir alimentaire, mais c'est la seule chose pour qu'ils puissent euh, se nourrir. Euh, donc, euh, c'est ça. Donc, la réconciliation, pour nous autres, ça signifie le, le, une subvention. Nous utilisons plutôt le terme décolonisation, car les trop nombreuses personnes des Premières Nations qui ne s'alimentent pas chaque jour, ça je viens de vous le dire, bon. <rire> la sécurité alimentaire, c'est pas les contrôles alimentaires, euh, mais c'est plutôt un engagement politique pour construire un mariage agroalimentaire dans les régions. Nos politiciens et politiciennes fédérales, provinciales et des conseils de banque euh, n'ont pas le courage ni la volonté d'assurer aux Autochtones de se nutrir bon, correctement. Le silence est politiquement rentable et pas trop dispendieux. 
Par contre, je vous ai dit ça, c'est peut-être pas drôle, mais moi, je vois l'avenir un petit peu différemment. J'espère que ça va se faire. Voici mon avenir. C'est peut-être parce que je suis un petit peu plus vieille. Tu te relèves vieille. Ceci étant dit, il existe maintenant des programmes de traduction et de Skype pour nous réunir, pour ne plus euh, diviser les autochtones en agroalimentation. Les structures di euh, divisionnelles de la colonisation ont créé un, page, un état d'esprit de méfiance envers, envers tous les acteurs que je viens de, euh, qui, que je viens de nommer. Il est possible de voir le futur autrement et de se faire confiance. La colonisation a construit l'enracinement de, la de la méfiance de part et d'autre. La décolonisation en affaires s'est décidée de faire confiance. Pour cela, moi je vois que trois comportements de base sont essentiels. Un, opter pour un partenariat décisionnel au lieu de contrôle de l'autre ou de son projet. Deux, Transmettre l'information rapidement au lieu de retenir, de retenir l'information ou de ne pas divulguer de l'information. Trois, pour les autochtones, faire des suivis. Pour, le, pour les allochtones, poser des questions. Un bel exemple. Agriculture Canada a un programme présentant de subventions qui s'adresse pour la première fois aux commerçants indépendants. Et c'est comme ça. Moi, là, ma tentation, je n'ai jamais eu de subvention là, comme telle. Là. Et là, j'essaie d'avoir euh, un, un, un projet, j'espère bien. C'est la première fois qu'on s'adresse à des indépendants, non pas à des, 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 des coopératives. À des, des coopératives aussi, mais rien qui vient du conseil de banque. Donc, moi, je trouve que c'est un excellent pas dans... C'est un excellent pas, mais il faut quand même que ça soit un petit peu plus large. Pour sa part, le MAPAC est disposé à assister les fermes autochtones même si elles n'ont pas de numéro de production et ne sont pas enregistrées à l'UPA. La collègue avait bien raison. Moi, j'ai vécu beaucoup de racisme avec l'UPA. Je ne suis pas intéressée par la partie de l'UPA. Le mot d'ordre pour les. C est, c est, le, le mot d'ordre qui a été transmis depuis six ans au MAPAC, c'est de refaire les liens avec les communautés autochtones. N'ayez pas peur de, de leur parler. Maintenant, j'ai des questions. Serait-il souhaitable un programme d'agriculture et agroalimentaire pour les Premières Nations? Serait-il souhaitable des ressources agronomiques et en économie pour les fermes individuelles ou regroupement de fermes en coopérative ou communautaire? Serait-il souhaitable un programme épicerie qui serait administré et rentabilisé par des individus ou par un conseil de vente des les achats, transport, conservation, vente d'épicerie, sans aucun projet agraire dans une communauté. À chaque fois qu'on parle d'une communauté, écoutez, il y a des communautés qui ont 600 personnes, là. Pensez-vous que les agriculture sont peut-être intéressés quand il y a 30 de leurs de leur personnes qui sont en, en diabétique? Il faut être réaliste. Ils ne sont pas capables d'aller chercher leur nourriture, c'est trop loin. Serait-il souhaitable une formation avec des ressources spécialisées en partenariat d'affaires entre entreprises agroalimentaires individuelles ou un, un regroupement quelconque ou par le conseil de vente? Serait-il souhaitable de faire des affaires en, en produisant des semences? Moi, ce que j'entends, les semences, ce n'est pas ce qui est le plus euh, important, c'est de faire en sorte que ces gens-là soient nourris. Là, moi, je travaille de façon euh, politisée. J'ai beaucoup de portes qui me... Je n'ai pas encore le nez plat, là, mais ça, ça s'en vient. Mais je continue. Merci. Merci, Joanne. Je ne je vais pas essayer de synthétiser ça, euh, parce qu'il y a eu beaucoup de contenu. Euh, en tout cas, ce qui, euh, ce qui, ce qui ressort pour moi, c'est euh, ce que tu disais, c'est qu'il n'y a, a pas de chef de file au sein d'organisations autochtones ou au sein d'organismes gouvernementaux autour de l'agriculture, l'agroalimentaire en milieu autochtone, que euh, les, les besoins de, de, de formation, de développement de compétences sont euh, non seulement en agriculture, mais aussi en, en gestion d'affaires euh, et en gestion d'entreprise. Euh, donc je te remercie pour, pour, avoir ce, pour ton courage, pour ton, tout ton travail, ta détermination, ta persévérance dans, dans ce domaine-là. Euh, 
Je fais, il est, uh, it's, it's uh, five minutes to three. So we have, you know, 10, 15 minutes to, uh, to have uh, some, uh, some closing, uh, closing comments. Um, I don't know how, uh, how, how you folks are, are, are feeling, Valerie, John, Curtis, and Sonia. Do, do you want to continue the conversation? Do we, do we finish the conversation? How do, how, where do you want to go from here? I mean... Right. Okay. So, so why, why, why not do uh, maybe you know a, a last round of, of interventions in terms of uh, you know maybe, maybe you know how do how do we move forward from here? How do you see yourself moving over the the next uh, the next uh, years in terms of of uh, your own projects? You, we, we mentioned some some uh, uh, Joanne was mentioning some some issues around uh, funding. Um, some of the challenges of accessing funding. Um, do uh, do you want to do you want to take it over uh, from there? Yeah. Il y avait une question. Vas-y. Joanne. Tiens. Déjà merci uh, Joanne de nous rapporter uh, toute. Uh, cette information-là. C'est dommage qu'à chaque fois qu'on entend parler de, de la communauté euh, autochtone, en fait, on a toujours le, le cœur serré, le cœur brisé. On entend rarement des... On entend des bonnes nouvelles, mais on entend beaucoup des choses qui, 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 qui nous bouleversent. Puis on se demande toujours un peu, mais comment... Comme on se sent démunis, tu sais, on se dit comment est-ce que je pourrais aider sans être intrusif, tu sais. Euh, étant donné que tu es ici avec nous dans la pièce, puis que dans la pièce, il y a euh, des agronomes, euh, des fermiers, euh, des gens euh, spécialisés euh, dans toutes sortes de choses, s'il y, euh, y avait une façon qu'on pourrait aider concrètement, qu'est-ce qu'on pourrait faire? Ne pas aider, mais d'assister. Pas aider, mais d'assister. Comment? Il n'y a, 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 a pas de comment? Quelle est votre formation? C'est qu -ce, quoi votre expertise? Qu'est-ce qui, qu qui, qu que vous aimez dans votre expertise qui fait que vous êtes unique puis que vous, avez, vous voulez euh, offrir ce partage-là? C'est une question que je vous pose, oui? C'est ça? Je suis semencière, arboriste, maraîchère. Semencière, arboriste, maraîchère. Ben, madame dit qu'elle est semencière, arboriste et euh, maraîchère, mais euh, c'est comme, euh, je vais vous donner un exemple, mon euh, Charlie Jacob qui est pas ici, je vais cultiver avec lui du yacon, il y a son expertise, j'ai mon expertise et on va la mettre ensemble. On s'est connus juste un petit peu l'année passée et puis euh, bon, on a, je lui ai proposé mon, mon projet puis ça l'intéressait. Euh, je pourrais le proposer ailleurs, puis ça pourrait les intéresser. C'est des échanges. Pensez à faire. Est-ce qu'il y a, a d'autres producteurs de, de yacon ici? Est-ce qu'il y a des personnes qui ont de l'expérience à produire du yacon? C'est quoi, quoi du yacon? <rire> le yacon, c'est euh, Céline Belmar, où est-ce qu'elle est passée, elle, là? En tout cas, c'est Céline Belmar qui m'a... Euh, quand j'étais à, à la fête des semences à Montréal l'année passée, euh, moi, moi j'aime ça savoir tout ce qui est nouveau. Je veux goûter à tout. Je suis comme ça. Alors euh, là, elle m'a parlé du yacon, puis j'ai goûté. Là, mon cœur a flanché. Donc, j'en ai acheté une ou deux. Puis là, j'ai fait des recherches. Puis là, j'ai dit, waouh, c'est extraordinaire. C'est un tubercule que, comme une patate. Mais ça goûte, le, la, la goûte la poire sucrée. C'est pour ça qu'ils appellent la poire de terre. Mais le sucre fait en sorte que ça ne va pas dans le sang. Donc, c'est extraordinaire, ça peut même favoriser les, 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 les probiotiques du, de l'estomac, etc. Donc, pour les diabétiques, d'avoir un, un estomac en santé, c'est très important. Et la plupart du temps, ils ne l'ont pas, ça, en santé. Donc, ça fait partie de mon projet que je ne vous dirai pas tout. <rire> si vous voulez savoir, si vous voulez... Ça, c'est autre chose. Donc, euh, c'est ça, il faut partir... Puis, il faut être du carré, c'est tout. Puis, 
Moi, ce que j'espère, c'est de, de me faire entendre par mes amis ici, s'ils sont intéressés à faire, la, à faire cette culture-là, parce que moi, je pense que dans trois ans, dans deux ans, parce que, euh, on va être capable de commercialiser. Plus on est de personnes qui le cultivent, plus on, puis, plus on, on va pouvoir euh, vendre sur le marché, mais aussi, il y, a de la, il y a une question de faire de la recherche et de développement. Et puis, moi, mon rêve, là, c'est que ça soit une, une, une entreprise euh, autochtone, parce que présentement, le marché est ouvert au Canada puis au Québec. Donc, euh, puis il y a un marché pour les diabétiques. Donc, pour moi, c'est mon rêve. Merci. Okay, euh, oui, merci, merci, Joanne. Um, I, I don't know if there was uh, other, other answers to, to Kelly's comment or or uh, if folks wanted to, 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 to uh, rebound on, on some of the, the comments that, uh, that uh, Joanne, uh, uh, Joanne made. So the question was, is how do people help? That was the question? How could any one of us tomorrow, how could any one of us tomorrow help? Okay, um, so what I would recommend, um, This has been a, a, a reoccurring question in all of uh, the people who are asking that question. It, it, I mean, it's, it happens every day. Like, how do we be better, okay? And this, this goes back to a concept which we've been uh, naming here, which is the uh, um, reconciliation or decolonization, okay? It really goes deep into the roots of each individual. So. Uh, personally, I don't expect that uh, 100% of um, I don't, immigrants, okay, like it's uh, the people who came over from Europe, uh, I don't expect everybody to be on the same page. And that is the foundation of my, my knowledge as uh, Uh, is that I have my worldview, you have your worldview, and that we don't uh, destroy each other's paths, okay? So a reoccurring thing which uh, has happened is that there are two people, uh, two different cultures, two different worldviews, and one always will like to uh, reinforce their thoughts over the other. And Um, it's because of the, the centuries of, of trauma which uh, I have, well, I have, I have experienced through my generations of family now that I am dealing with right now, okay? So that being said, uh, I'm not entirely sure that uh, I am comfortable partnering up with anybody because I am at this process now of really looking for what what it was what was that like special um what was the answer to being one with nature like it's it's as simple as that like as a farmer my goal is to be able to exist with nature without destroying it without having to uh work against it uh and I would expect my relationships with everybody around me to work the same, but it would be foolish of me to expect that of others. I cannot change anybody. So what I would ask is for each individual to walk out today and to ask, well, what is your each special gift that you can contribute to making yourself a better person and very lovingly make other people a better person too, uh, without forcing, because it's that force, uh, forcing relationships and, and forcing ideas onto each other, which has gotten us here today. So. Thanks, Valerie. Um, I don't know if there's other, if, if other uh, participants want to, 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 to bounce on the ideas that were shared by, by Joanne and, and Valerie. Um, any, any, uh, any comments, John? You have the mic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was actually just asked this yesterday. Um, uh, what, what were so, you asked? Uh, this is along the lines of uh, how can we help without yeah. stepping too far? And uh, 
there's really no solid answer for that i guess <laughs> it's i i find that uh uh Everyone should really appreciate help, but it's hard to tell whether or not somebody's really trying to help or if they're, they might not even realize it, they're trying to benefit themselves and trying to give themselves that self-fulfillment of helping an indigenous community, something like that. Where, uh, yeah, so I think that uh, yeah, it's hard to really be able to reach out and find the right people that do want to accept the help and things like that. Like, I've definitely experienced that multiple times even in the last year that people are uh, reaching out to me and it's kind of uncomfortable <laughs> they put you in uncomfortable situations and uh yeah so i i try to be as open-minded as possible you can a lot of times you can tell when people are genuine and, and they really do want to help you and if uh, i think like uh knowledge sharing is the uh, the biggest thing is where it's kind of not the mansplaining or uh, forcing your knowledge, assuming that you're completely 100% right is where you share what you know or what you've been taught and with an open mind that it might not be 100% correct, but it's what you're taught. So, yeah, it's kind of having that open mind. So, Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would like to uh, address this, this question with um, educate yourself. You know, understand who the indigenous people of this area is. A lot of times this truth and reconciliation, um, land recognition came out. We get politicians who do it all the time. They don't do the research. They talk about the contemporary Aboriginal people who live in the area or the indigenous people when they were relocated. And I've acknowledged that to um, some environmental conferences that I've been a part of saying, you know, it's good that you're trying to do this reconciliation, you're acknowledging um, the indigenous populations, but they moved here within contemporary time, within history. This is the traditional territory of another people who are not here anymore. They've been absorbed or they've been um, sent out into great ventures of Canada, so we, can, we need to acknowledge them. So what I've been doing is uh, encouraging partners and um, friends of our program, if you're gonna do an, a land acknowledgement, study our um, Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address. We call it the Haudenosaunee That's the words that come before all else. And it identifies everything in our natural world and even some of our supernatural uh, um, planets and stars and concepts like wind and um, things of that nature. So it puts all of our mind together. We go in one direction. We agree that these things are still important to us. Um, and there, there is even a um, uh, a topic area in there for the three sisters or the life sustainers. So we acknowledge them. All plants, trees, animals, birds. That's the best land acknowledgement you could get or you could give if you would just understand that and study that. Um, be thankful every day for what we have. It's not our culture, it's not our, our manner to ask for things, but we give thanks for what we have. So I would suggest um, study that, understand that. And another item I know is because we, I'm studying heirloom seeds and I'm collecting and I'm, I'm planting and I'm creating seed and I'm distributing seeds to people and I'm going to these seed events. So. I, I find some non-indigenous people who are planting seeds or were gifted these seeds, and they say, I'm the caretaker of this corn now because it was be trusted on me. Um, you have to understand there's still an intellectual property where it's still Haudenosaunee varieties. It's still varieties that our ancestors are. Seven generations have planted and planted and continued that variety. Um, it's still our seeds. It belongs to our grandchildren. It belongs to their grandchildren. It's not your seed. We get that a lot of times with these seed catalogs, you know, and they'll rename a, a variety, um, they'll stamp it, and so those of us who keep our own seeds understand that these have been passed on for generations. All the trauma that our people have suffered, uh, experiences with colonialization, what have you, we're still maintaining those seed varieties. 
So understand when you get a traditional variety of corn, beans, or squash, you know, understand where that seed came, how many hands that went through, how it's been conditioned to be planted here on Turtle Island. Thank you. Thanks, Curtis. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, one thing that I think is important, and maybe no one agrees with me, uh, is um, to in our from in my community. I'm going to speak for me, my children, and my community. Um, is I try to stop talking about colonialism uh, like in the past, and see that we're still living and benefiting from colonial structures in our governments, in our farms, and concept of land ownership and so I recommend one thing I recommend for people when I'm talking with them in my community is to sit with that uncomfortable concept and then if you don't have answers kind of ask uncomfortable questions because we're at this point in history where we can kind of move forward in these situations and and make the mistakes and and try and try and ask the uncomfortable questions and maybe say things that are we think might be wrong but it, it, if i think if your heart's in the good place and you're thinking about acknowledging that colonialism is still something that we're benefiting from then you can do your own self work um, and improve things that you're benefiting from and challenge these organizations like the upa or the map pack in constructive ways by asking questions when we go to their meetings and and, and use, use that, that voice that we have to challenge those institutions that it may be also benefiting from structures of colonialism that are still in place. So that was just like, it's one sort of reflection that I'm going through as a person and that I'm trying to share with my children. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank, <laughs> I wanted to thank everybody for coming and for sharing like the, the projects that you're working on and uh, the, your farms and your stories and and I hope that this is just the beginning of like many more discussions and hopefully this week or this this today and tomorrow we can continue this over you know um, over different um, panels and over drinks and and food and stuff like that so that the, the conversation continues because it's a it's not something that we're going to solve today or tomorrow it may take generations for us to work through what has been going on in our in our you know in our country and on turtle island and in canada and quebec and in our small municipalities so i just wanted to take the time to, to thank everybody yeah. 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 Yeah.